Hi, folks. This is Eno signing for transportation. We're going to start in one minute. Stand by. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Robert Fuentes with the ENO Center for Transportation. I want to welcome you to the latest in our ENO webinars. Today, we present a rapid response webinar on transportation at the ballot box, when we're going to look at how transportation-related measures fared uh, in yesterday's off-year vote. As folks know, yesterday or this year was a kind of a light election. There were a couple of governor's races, um, some state legislatures, and some other things that were up. But this year, both before and during Election Day, voters played a really critical role in shaping communities from coast to coast by casting their votes on investments and other decisions about transportation. That in itself is really not a surprise. Here at Eno, we have been comprehensively tracking ballot measures that are related to transportation for a number of years. Um, we know that voters from coast to coast regularly decide on funding, advisory, governance, and other related issues related to transportation all throughout the year, particularly on Election Day uh, in November. It is hard to say whether this is a growing trend since there are a number of fluctuations um, from year to year, uh, particularly whether or not it's a national election. So for example, there were many, many measures on the ballot in 2016. We already know that there are going to be an awful lot in 2020. Uh, but that said, we do know there were a number of important measures on the ballot yesterday. So we are still going through the results. This is why this is a rapid response webinar. We do not have all of the, uh, the details in yet, but already we're seeing several common themes and trends that are starting to emerge. So here with me is Ramak Aves, a policy analyst here at Eno, who's gonna walk through what we know so far. Uh, once he's done with that, we are going to take some questions and engage in dialogue with the folks on the phone. So please use the questions function on the webinar website to submit. You don't have to wait until uh, Ramak is done to submit questions. I also want to point out that the Eno Center for Transportation does not endorse or oppose any of these measures. All this information is being pro provided for research purposes only. So thank you all again for taking the time to join us. Take it away, Ramak. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so let's dive right in. So. Um, this year on the ballot, there were over 200 ballot measures, um, including 126 um, that took place either last night, um, as well as a couple of outstanding elections um, that will be taking place in Louisiana and Oklahoma next week on November the 12th. Uh, cumulative, together, all of these ballot, uh, ballot measures um, totaled up to $19 billion in potential uh, investment uh, in various modes of transportation in 31 states. Um, and as of our current count, um, based on current results, um, over $8 billion um, of that proposed uh, funding has been approved by voters. So looking at what was on the ballot this year, there were roughly three big themes. Um, we outlined this in our um, top 10 uh, measures to watch last week. Um, and ahead of Tuesday's elections um, in ETW, but the three big themes were um, several big transit measures, um, state revenue collection and broader transportation governance, as well as several large general obligation bonds um, in various counties, localities, as well as um, one statewide measure in the state of Maine. So when we look at measure types that were on the ballot, um, most were primarily sales taxes, property taxes, uh, bond measures, as well as two fuel taxes um, in municipalities in Oregon. Um, some initial takeaways were that um, of the sales taxes, um, we have a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, 18 of the sales tax measures passed um, as of current results, uh, 10 did not. Um, but when we look at which types of measures passed, um, those that were renewals um, passed across the board, 
Um, but about 50-50 when we look at measures that were either new taxes or sales tax increases. Um, so we're seeing a bit of a mixed picture in terms of um, voter appetite for uh, various sales tax measures. Um, similarly, with property taxes, um, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, nine of them passed and six did not. Um, most were also similarly a mix of renewals um, and new taxes. Um, and similarly, some of the initial results were showing um, that renewals had an easier time getting passed on this ballot, um, while appetite for new uh, or increased taxes um, did not fare so well. Uh, the bond measures overwhelmingly performed very well. Um, there were several of those on the ballot, um, and overwhelmingly, 36 of them uh, passed and three did not. Um, and there are two local fuel tax increases um, or new taxes um, in the state of Oregon. Uh, that also passed. Um, but on to the big picture in terms of some key measures that we're watching um, and some thematic takeaways um, based on last night. Uh, there, it was a very good night for some of the big transit measures on the ballot. Um, one of the most notable was the $3.5 billion transit bond um, in Harris County uh, to fund uh, Houston Metro's Metro Next program that will invest over three and a half million dollars in new light rail construction, several new, uh, over 70 miles of uh, new BRT routes, um, as well as some improvements and new lane, uh, HOV lanes for, uh, uh, for transit. Um, so that was uh, approved overwhelmingly um, by a almost 60-40 margin. Um, in Cincinnati, uh, a transit measure um, that repealed the 0.3% uh, income tax on transit was passed, um, but that will only kick in if voters uh, next March approve a dedicated sales tax increase uh, for transit in Cincinnati. So while this was a tax repeal, it sets up um, a vote for next year um, in which voters um, appear to be on track potentially to approve a dedicated sales tax to fund transit. Um, in San Francisco, similarly, um, a new tax on rideshare trips, including Uber and Lyft trips, um, appears to be on track to pass. Um, as of current results, it uh, garnered about 56% of the vote, and it will only take effect if two-thirds of voters approve it, so that appears to be holding up. Um, but if passed, a, this will generate over um, $30 million annually uh, for dedicated funding to transit and pedestrian safety projects. Uh, in the Bay Area. Um, the second big theme of the night um, dealt with state revenue collection practices as well as broader transportation governance. So one of the big uh, measures on the ballot was um, Colorado's Proposition CC, which was um, an initiative to allow the state of Colorado to uh, definitely keep revenues that it collects over its existing uh, revenue cap known as TABOR. Um, so currently, Colorado uh, is required to uh, provide a table refund uh, of whatever revenue collects over its uh, revenue cap. Um, this measure sought to repeal that and instead allow the state to keep uh, those excess revenues for transportation and public education, but that measure uh, failed last night. Um, another very big measure on the ballot was Washington State Initiative 976, which uh, aims to cap uh, vehicle registration fees to $30 as well as repeal the authority of uh, local transit agencies to um, uh, enact uh, vehicle registration levies. Um, that is also on track to pass, um, which um, estimates show um, will lead to uh, several hundred million um, in re reduction for uh, transit agencies like Sound Transit, um, as well as the um, local transportation benefit districts um, that many localities in Washington use um, that are funded primarily through vehicle registration fees. Um, at a local level, um, the city of Denver passed a measure overwhelmingly to uh, rename and reorganize its existing Department of Public Works as the Denver Department of Transportation, which was elevated to a cabinet level agency as part of a broader effort to reorient um, the department towards uh, mobility, equity and mobility, um, as well as uh, allow the city to take a more proactive role in its own transportation initiatives. Um, so a lot of implications for state revenue collection uh, as well as transportation governance uh, based on what we're seeing out of last night. Um, and lastly, another major theme 
from last night was the success of large general obligation bonds that fund um, a range of uh, transportation measures. Some of these were more traditional bread and butter, road repair, construction and highway um, projects and others um, were slightly more multimodal. Um, a couple big ones that we were uh, cataloging here at Eno, um, Henry County, Georgia had a major uh, local option tax renewal um, to fund um, a major bond that passed last night. Maine was the only state to have a statewide infrastructure bond totaling over 105 million for uh, transportation and other infrastructure packages um, that passed overwhelmingly, um, as well as the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, that had a, a range of general obligation bonds ranging from parks to affordable housing and uh, both streets and public transportation. Um, and all of the transportation-related bonds um, passed overwhelmingly. So um, as we can see, uh, there was a huge appetite um, and a lot of success for transit-oriented measures on the ballot, um, and some of these uh, results will have some uh, deep implications for um, state transportation priorities going forward. Um, as we um, continue to have results trickle in, um, we'll be um, cataloging them and um, updating uh, accordingly in the days and weeks ahead. Excellent. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Ronick. So uh, you can go ahead and uh, submit questions or comments using the question function on the webinar website. We've already got a couple um, that are coming in. And uh, there are several asking for whether the data is going to be available um, and whether it's going to be downloadable. It certainly is. Uh, you can tell you that you can find all of the, the analyses we've done um, in years past on Eno's website, www.enotrans.org, um, and this will be up there um, as well. So, uh, Ron, a couple of questions coming in about um, Washington State's Initiative 976. Just give us an overview of what that initiative was designed to do and what the implications you think might be for trans. I know some of this is coming in, it's not entirely clear, but but find a little more detail on, on what that initiative was. Yes, so the um, Car Tabs Initiative, um, it's been um, a measure that's appeared on the Washington um, ballot um, in years past, um, but basically would limit um, the collection of uh, car tabs of vehicle registration to $30 in the state of Washington. In some localities, it is much higher. In some localities, it's around or under 30 um, this has a lot of implications for transportation funding in Washington because a lot of uh, transit agencies, as well as local municipalities, um, use uh, car tab um, and vehicle registration uh, funds from those uh, registration levies to fund transportation projects. Um, so as, alongside uh, capping that at $30, it also uh, repeals the authority of uh, agencies like Sound Transit um, to use revenue from vehicle registration. Um, and so one state... Uh, analysis showed that um, around $300 million um, in revenue for sound transit is at stake um, if that is uh, enacted, as well as um, several hundred million um, in overall state revenue, and um, I believe around uh, under $100 million uh, cumulatively for uh, the, the local transportation benefit districts um, that uh, localities around uh, Washington State use um, vehicle registration funds for. So. Um, if it's on track to pass, and if it does, um, it'll be a, um, a lot of uh, rethinking of how to um, reorient uh, transportation funding in uh, Washington. This was the really the big one, I think, around the country for a lot of different reasons. And judging from the questions that we have coming in, there's a lot of interest in in that. And um, from these questions, folks wondering, are we are we actually underplaying just how disastrous this is going to be in that region? Or maybe folks are saying, actually, it's not going to be that disastrous, that the region should be living more within its means or something. So I think a lot of that we don't know right now. We're certainly going to see some of that reporting um, in the days and months ahead. Uh, a couple of folks were asking also about this big measure that that um, uh, that took place in the San Francisco Bay to put a, a, a ride-sharing charge on, on, on the PNCs. Was there, I didn't think there was anything else related to ride share and regulations or anything around the country. It seemed like the big one was in San Francisco, is that right? That is right. Um, it was unique in that it was one of the only measures dealing with ride share. Um, in terms of broader tech, um, there were some measures unrelated to transportation 
um, I believe, um, either in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, I believe New Jersey, um, dealing with um, short-term rentals. Uh, but in terms of uh, new uh, companies such as uh, Rideshare, um, this was unique, um, not only in the fact that it addressed Rideshare, but that it was a uh, Rideshare tax. Yeah, I wonder if we're going to see, we know that there's going to be a bunch of these next year in 2020. Um, I think we've seen hints that there might be some regulatory stuff next year, but um, I also believe people are probably waiting to see what happened here in San Francisco. And that was just barely passed, right? They did two-thirds. Yeah, so the um, uh, as, um, our last um, check, it appears that it garnered just slightly over two-thirds uh, of the votes, but um, votes are still rolling in from the West Coast. So um, it remains to be seen whether it will stay at that margin or perhaps dip below. Um, but it, as of now, it appears on track to yeah, you know, two thirds is a difficult, difficult hurdle there in, in California. Um, say a little more about the, the the fuel tax increases that you saw. A couple of folks were asking about that. I know last year, I believe all of the fuel tax measures failed. There were four voters. There was a big one in Missouri. I think there were one or two others. Um, what does it look like this year? So there were only two um, in these uh, uh, municipalities in Oregon. Um, not much detail. Um, specifically on um, projects funded. Um, it's unique in that they were both in Oregon um, and both uh, aim to um, provide some more funding uh, for various transportation priorities um, and both passed by a um, relatively healthy margin, um, not blow up, um, but you need that of the two that were on the ballot, um, both of them passed and um, especially at a time when we were seeing a, such a mixed picture when it came to sales tax increases and property tax increases um, a lot of which did not fare well on the ballot. Um, it was interesting that um, voters in these municipalities um, appear to um, have approved these uh, levies at a time when um, uh, tax increases um, across the board um, did not fare so well. So there's a bunch of questions. So a lot of folks are wondering um, about the role or the, the, the measure that focused on tech and on kind of new mobility services. I think, you know, I think for the most part, these are pretty traditional measures, right? When you look at the whole pan to be what's out there, it's not a lot of really innovative stuff. Exactly. Um, besides, um, you know, the bond in Houston um, and the uh, measure in San Francisco, um, a lot of these measures were very much uh, bread and butter bond um, elections um, and uh, renewals for various um, sales taxes um, and millages and property taxes um, were you know, already um, enacted in years past. Um, so of the ones that stood out, uh, there was really um, some of the big investments um, that Houston vote, or Harris County voters approved, um, as well as the uh, dedicated source for uh, transit and pedestrian safety projects in San Francisco. But other than that, um, nothing really notable in terms of projects funded. Um, even some of the projects um, in our initial count, um, it appears uh, road projects, uh, most of the measures on the ballot um, were overwhelmingly for roads. So we have 70 road measures, uh, 13 transit measures, 11 multimodal ones, and only five uh, bike ped um, projects. And most of these road projects, um, you know, may have contained some sidewalk component, um, but overwhelmingly, um, you know, very few of these were multimodal in nature. Um, and even then, um, it appears, you know, the road component. Um, had the you know primary was the primary recipient of funding, so um, nothing particularly uh, new or um, novel on the ballot this year. Yeah, and it's hard for us to, to figure out exactly with a lot of precision what these measures are. And there's as we know, there's hundreds and hundreds of these. Some of them may be using kind of new tech. Some of it may might be the evolution of things they're doing. But if they're ones that were very uh, forward-looking, that would always be identified in the in the language for the measure. Yeah, and it appears uh, 2020, um, and I think part of the reason why um, there were not nearly as many on the ballot this year, and particularly as many novel um, or uh, new or bold project uh, measures that stood out on the ballot this year, um, it appears that a lot of localities and municipalities are gearing up to put a lot of those more transformative measures um, on the ballot next year. Yeah, it does seem like I've got it already. Uh, a couple of folks are asking about just to clarify. When we say the measure failed, mm -hmm. we mean that it didn't. It didn't. Um, it, it, a majority of the, of the yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not. A, it's not a qualitative assessment about the, the 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 bill itself or the language. It's just whether or not it was passed by going exactly. Okay. Um, so when you talked about the uh, 
the different modes, break down the, um, the revenue sources a little bit, right? We know that there were a bunch of these. There's sales tax measures, there's property tax measures, income taxes, fuel taxes. How, how does that all break down? So it appears uh, most of the funding um, is split pretty equally between um, bond measures um, and sales tax revenue. So while um, you know only 13 of the um, 200 measures were transit measures, um, the transit proposals accounted for you know nearly nine billion of the proposed uh, funding on the table. Um, much of that was uh, very clearly the bond in Houston. Um, so it was um, a bit of a mixed bag. It was about half and half um, in terms of uh, bond revenue and uh, sales tax revenue. Um, and the fuel taxes were a very, very small share of the uh, measures. But transit was the largest recipient uh, of yes. that program? The, the largest recipient of the uh, proposed funding on the table. Mostly because of what happened in, in, in Harris County. Yeah. So there's a bunch of questions in here that are, that are hard to feel because there's uh, folks who are wondering about the change from year to year. We're still going through a lot of this right now. Um, we're trying to pull out some of these common themes. As, as Ramak was saying, um, it does seem, at least in years past, that we saw a trend towards more multimodal projects that were being successful, um, that projects that were relying on bonding were, were more successful, um, and in years past, projects that relied on fuel tax revenue as said, are, were not successful. So some of that still holds us here. Some of it may not. Um, the challenging thing is trying to detect whether or not there is something that is consistently emerging or if the stuff just really depends on on the particular measures that are in front of voters. And turnout. Um, turnout. Yeah, I mean, for, you know, some of these races um, in some of these states, you know, uh, turnout might be higher than usual um, for an off-year election and others. Um, they uh, might have been the opposite. So um, a lot of factors at stake, especially when you have an off-year election, um, but I think one noticeable trend is just the um, sheer amount of measures on the ballot. Um, I believe last year was over 430. Um, and this year, um, as of uh, what we've been tracking so far, uh, just over 200. Um, so um, we are seeing, again, some similar patterns, as Rob said. Um, bonds across the board are doing much better, uh, but notably much fewer um, multimodal uh, measures. Um, and then those measures that did have some multimodal uh, elements um, we're still, based on our read of the measures, still overwhelmingly, um, you know, traditionally uh, road and highway-oriented projects um, with some, you know, sidewalk repair or repaving um, element to them, which appear to be contrast from uh, what we put, uh, what we saw last year, where um, we saw huge successes and um, a larger share of multimodal um, projects. And we should say we're trying to just track those measures that we can really identify are specific for transportation. And if there are combined measures where we could uh, identify the transportation components. So there were some measures that would go with raising a sales tax. There would be a transportation piece and a piece for education and a piece for some housing or something. If we can't identify which part goes to transportation, we weren't including it. So we're trying to get that precision so that we can make those kinds of, those kinds of assessments. Um, but for the most part, these, these are all pretty um, silent, right? We don't really see... But with, with, with few exceptions, we really don't see combining um, uh, di different disciplines. The Tabor one in Colorado, I think, was one, one exception. Yeah, the Tabor one uh, almost exclusively uh, split the funds 50-50 um, to public transportation, uh, public education um, and uh, transportation. At the local level, in some uh, smaller municipalities, some of these uh, bond measures were uh, kind of broader infrastructure proposals, um, but most of them... Uh, did, you know, have you know, silo dedicated projects for transportation um, at the larger level. So as you move up to larger counties um, and at the state level in Maine, um, over mostly um, towards transportation and a little bit more siloed uh, than perhaps um, at, we would see at the uh, local level in some of these smaller municipalities where um, some of these uh, bonds are packaged into one big community uh, capital investment or infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a couple of folks are asking, can, can we, is there anything we can say, maybe you're just, this is speculating now, but your own opinion, but anything we can say about what happened in Colorado with the table or measure, anything, because that did combine a bunch of different things. Well, my, the only um, thing I can think of is just perhaps um, it, it involved voters uh, relinquishing their tax refunds that they get every year um, through the state government. 
um, to perhaps it uh, this was a reflection of uh, unwillingness to um, you know give up a, a, a material item that folks were receiving, um, whereas you know and perhaps some of these other areas where you saw in, to tax increases, um, perhaps there was something else at play. Um, but there also could be you know a lot of local political um, issues at play. Um, so um, it's hard to tell, um, especially not being in Colorado. Um, but uh, hard to speculate, but perhaps um, my initial read would just be either you know, a mix of state politics, um, political issues, as well as the fact that it was a very material um, material item that voters would be giving up, but also some about language, too. Um, you know, it's, at, I mean, at first read, it's hard to exactly figure out um, what the ballot measure um, is doing. It's phrased in a way that says, you know, it will not increase taxes, um, but in many ways, you know, the act of revoking a refund um, can be construed by some as, you know, calculating a higher total tax bill. Um, so um, a lot of complex factors at play, and this goes to show, in broader sense, you know, ballot language also has, you know, major implications on, you know, some of these measures because, you know, the easier they are to explain um, versus those that are more complicated. And there are a bunch of questions. <laughs> Unless you made a feel on that, on that particular, there's really, and I, I, we, we can't really say what we know about the, the, the measures themselves. Folks are wondering, is it, it, it is a simpler message better? Probably it is, right? Um, is a message that's oriented around economic development better than just transportation? So there's not, not a whole lot, I think, that we know about the language of the measures. Yeah, and I think I mean, there were a couple of big ones on the ballot, but I think our sample size was so small. I mean, you had the, uh, the Harris County measure, which was very, very clear with three and a half billion. Um, a lot of the messaging did revolve around, um, you know, traffic flows um, and, you know, folks um, who are frustrated with their auto commutes. So perhaps, you know, there's a, um, you know, a argument to be made about, you know, how you pitch some of these bonds. But I think really when you looked at something like the Washington State Initiative, it was, um, the messaging was far clearer. It was, you know, the $30 cap initiative. And so that was something very clearly that was advertised, whereas, um, you know, with something like Colorado, the language is a bit complicated, um, but it also depends, um, you know, the arguments for the package might be harder to make because, you know, it involves, um, you know, tricky language about, you know, what constitutes a refund, what constitutes a tax increase, um, whereas, you know, in some of these uh, measures, perhaps the argument against is a lot easier, you know, you're giving up the tax refund or, you know, a vote no or a vote for this, you know, is a vote for X. So, um, I think we don't have a large enough sample size to extrapolate, um, but I think um, that's a, something to monitor going forward, especially in 2020, um, and looking at our past pool of measures, um, seeing whether ballot language um, and ballot messaging has an effect on, you know, the success rates. Um, but again, it's hard to measure um, because, you know, ballot language is relatively easy to try because you can read the text, um, but messaging, um, you know, there's tons of, you know, flyers and communications um, and social media and advocacy around uh, these measures. So um, definitely something for future research um, to look at. Yeah, we looked a little bit at this last year when, they, when there were a whole bunch of measures um, in 2018. We actually did a podcast series where we looked at six different measures and did really deep dives into them. We interviewed people who were uh, on the ground in those campaigns um, in, in California and Missouri, it was Tampa, a couple of really big ones. Uh, we did a podcast series with the folks at Infrastructure Week, and that's available up on kind of all, all podcast platforms. We'll give you some good idea um, of the background of some of those stories. But I think the bottom line is you really got to dig deep into each of these because the campaigns, especially for the very visible ones, uh, have a long backstory. Um, we're almost out of time. Just one more question. The, uh, folks who want the, the, the difference between measures that were going for renewals of existing taxes versus new taxes. Anything you can say about that? Yes. And so um, as we talked about, measures that were renewals um, based on our um, the initial results um, appear to be doing much better. Um, we the uh, of the sales tax measures we were tracking uh, the renewals um, all seem to pass appear to be passing. Um, but again it was almost a 50-50 um, in terms of whether some of these new taxes or tax increases passed or failed. Um, you know, some of that could be attributable to the fact that, you know, perhaps this is a reflection of, you know, appetite for um, new or increased taxes. Um, but again, 
um, without doing a deep dive and doing a case study of each of these, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to really tease out whether the ones that passed passed because, you know, there was a very specific ask and a very specific, um, you know, detail on how those funds would be appropriated and so folks are willing to uh, pitch in or um, whether some of these uh, measures were vague. So again, it's a right for future case studies, um, but the initial results appear to show that some of the newer, uh, new increase, new taxes or tax increases seem to be having a bit of a harder time being passed. But they did, um, a majority of them did pass it either 10 to 8 or 10 to 9. Yeah. Well, a lot more to come on this. Um, we're just about out of time, so I want to thank you all for your participation, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions and comments. If you have additional um, questions or need anything from us, our information is up on the website. You can email um, me or Ramek or anybody here, email, and we'll, we'll try to get you an answer. Um, we're going to stay involved in this issue. As we say, we're, this is just a really rapid, as you can see, rapid response to what happened um, yesterday. There's a bunch of measures next week, weirdly, um, but we're going to look at those, and then we will have this all compiled and available uh, up on our website. Um, so we're going to stay involved in this, as we have been for the last few years, and we're going to be certainly heavily involved um, in, in a lot of this work into 2020. Um, we'll also be presenting this work at the Transportation Research Board annual meeting. Is that you, Thomas? And, and Alice Grossman, somebody here at Eno, uh, with folks from the University of Washington. So if you're around for TRB, look out for that as well. So if you want any more information about Eno, you can check out our website at www.enotrans.org. And I also want you to encourage you to subscribe to Eno Transportation Weekly, an invaluable resource on all aspects of transportation policy and practice. So once again, thank you for your participation. Have a great afternoon.